So I'm going to talk about metals and liposomes, and because of all the previous talks, I think we'll be able to get through this reasonably quickly. So let's see how it goes. I have to make my computer work. Okay. Um, so liposomes, we've heard about. These are phospholipids that are hydrated, and they spontaneously adopt these spherical structures, which everybody's seen. When you first add the water to the phospholipids, they form these multilamellar structures, um, which are interesting to better understand lipid behavior in a bilayer system, but are not very useful as pharmaceuticals. To make them pharmaceuticals, you have to make them small and uniform. Uh, typically, we try to make them unilamellar liposomes, which is shown here. To do this, we developed a technique some time ago, and it's just to date myself in terms of how long this technology has been with us. Uh, we developed in the sort of mid-80s an extrusion technology which allowed you to take MLVs and force them through polycarbonate filters, and uh, the size of the liposomes after they went through those filters was about the size of the pore that the filters had. So if you had a 100 nanometer size uh, 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 pore in the filter, you then with up with 100 nanometer size liposomes, which is shown in this um, uh, free fracture electron micrograph. Uh, they're very uniform, very reproducible, and the process is very scalable. So uh, we developed a company, again, mid-80s, called Lipex, Extrude, uh, Lipex Biomembranes. They developed and sold extruders. That company merged with another company we started called Northern Lipids. Northern Lipids was recently acquired, not that recently, five years ago, it was acquired by Evonik. Um, and they're still producing these uh, devices for making uh, batches going from as little as one mil to as high as 800 mils in size. They actually have the technology to be able to do uh, formulations at a scale of um, many hundreds of liters. So it's a, it's a very good technology. There are alternatives. I know Precision is listening to this, and Precision has some very interesting technology, which uh, is also addressing the scale up in manufacturing side of uh, the lipid-based uh, nanosystems. So liposomes by themselves don't do anything. You really need to put something with them. There are occasional times when you use a lipid component, which is therapeutically active. Uh, but in most cases, we're using uh, relatively inert lipid components. Um, and the, what makes a liposome interesting is what you put inside the liposome. So how do you get a drug inside the liposome? Again, I'm going to refer to work that was done many, many, many years ago, which led to something called remote loading. And it started with a dye called saffron and O, which was a dye that was recommended to us as a dye to um, measure whether a liposomal membrane had an electrochemical gradient across it. So we made liposomes which had uh, potassium inside, sodium outside. We could add bolinomycin, and that would then create a, 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 a sodium potassium ion gradient, bolinomycin is a potassium ionophore. And if you added uh, saffron into it, you saw an absorption uh, change, uh, which is illustrated in this figure here. Again, a very old figure. So there is a, a pronounced decrease in absorbance at about 515, and an increase in absorbance at about 5, uh, 470. Uh, what this was really associated with was the fact that the saffron that you added to the outside of liposome was accumulated in, inside the liposome, and you got a, a, a change in the spectral properties of the saffron. Now, saffron is not an interesting therapeutic, uh, but we did have a collaborator. This is Peter Collis, had a collaborator, uh, a guy named Dr. Ben DeCroix, who uh, was at one of our lab meetings, and he pointed out that saffron looks a lot like a therapeutic called doxorubicin. I think people have heard a little bit about doxorubicin. and it's a very good and potent anti-cancer drug. And it really was the basis to uh, start um, a, an effort in the area of uh, liposome drug delivery for treatment of cancer. The technology worked really well. I'm trying to illustrate it very simply here. If you had a liposome with a pH gradient across it, and this was just making liposomes in a low pH environment, then exchanging that outside uh, pH to 7.5, that created a pH gradient. You add doxorubicin to the outside, it is uh, it has an amine function uh, in uh, the neutral pH. There's a fair portion of the drug that exists in the neutral form, it crosses the bilayer, but when inside the liposome, it encounters the low pH and becomes protonated and charged and trapped. Uh, this process happens very, very rapidly. You get 100% loading within minutes after addition to the liposome. That means 100% of the drug that you added to the outside of the liposome is now inside the liposome and you're ready to administer. 
What is important about drugs like doxorubicin is that they actually have a number of interesting chemical functions. So uh, they have an amine function, which can be uh, protonated and charged, and that's why we got pH gradient loading. But it was also important to note that these had metal binding functions, and work in Peter Cullis' lab started looking at metal binding of uh, um, uh, certain metals to doxorubicin and, and uh, their use in formulation of liposomes. We explored this a bit further, and it really was because um, the, well, I have to go back. If you try characterizing metal binding in the context of a compound that has a metal binding function and a pH function, it's never really clear what's driving the uptake, especially if you're using metals, which are often formulated at a low pH environment, because as you increase the pH, the metal will form a hydroxide and precipitate. So often these systems have both a pH gradient and a metal ion gradient, so it's very difficult to distinguish with what's causing the interaction. So one of the things we did is start looking at uh, drug candidates which only had metal binding functions. Uh, they didn't have ionizable functions suitable for pH gradients. These drug candidates often were, uh, had very poor in vivo properties that couldn't actually be used. That included uh, poor bioavailability uh, in unlikelihood of being able to formulate them for intravenous use, uh, limited uh, activity in terms of delivery to the site of action where you need it, and they are almost all referred to as sparingly soluble compounds in aqueous solutions. And I illustrate that with these figures, which uh, really highlight some of the work that was done by a PhD student of mine, Mo Weedy, who uh, looked at a compound called uh, uh, disulfiram, which was metabolized to diethyl, diethyl carbonate, um, and the active species of that um, uh, product, disulfiram, uh, was actually the, the DDC, diethyl, um, diethyl carbonate. Um, and it was only activated in the presence of copper. If you had that active compound in the presence of copper, it formed this large precipitate, and it couldn't be administered, it couldn't even be used. It was actually very potent. You can add it to cells in DMSO, but that's not a very useful approach. If you take the same approach and you now form the metal complex, but now inside a liposome to create what we call a metaplex uh, product, you have something that stays in solution and actually can be used uh, in, a, in a variety of different fashion. This technology was the foundation for formation of this company called Cooper's Pharmaceuticals that arose in the labs of BC uh, Cancer. Um, and I'll talk a little bit of it, uh, more about that, and that really is the point of today's presentation. So uh, it's a solution that relies on coordination chemistry and liposomes, and I believe the results are sometimes very surprising. The process is really quite simple. You can take a small molecule, even poorly solubilized one, and encapsulate it in liposomes. Uh, using uh, a metal that's trapped inside that liposome. So it's like a remote loading process. The metal sits within the liposome. You add the drug to the outside of the liposome, and then all of a sudden you have the drug inside the liposome forming these complexes. These formulations are suitable for parenteral, oral, or inhalation therapy. And I'm really going to talk about one example of drug. Before I do that, I want to just highlight this improvement in solubility. And I do apologize now for using a coded slide. I'm not doing this to try to maintain confidentiality. It is just uh, difficult for me to pronounce the names of some of these compounds. So I'm just going to refer to them as A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we've done now more than 30 compounds. And in every case, uh, we're able to show that the Metaplex formulation has a much higher solubility than the parent compound. Uh, this improvement in solubility can be as much as 500 fold, if not greater. So it's quite a remarkable technology and it's quite useful for this type of compound. Cooper's uh, and my own lab are really interested in developing small molecule therapeutics, which I'm sure Kishore is going to love me saying that, knowing we're going to debate the use of compounds uh, later on. But when we're developing these therapeutics, uh, we're thinking in terms of oncology, infectious disease, and immuno-oncology. I'm really going to talk about the oncology area right now. So the example I'm going to give you is a compound called CX5461. It was developed as an RNA-1 polymerase inhibitor. It's first-in-class compound. It's very poorly soluble at physiological pHs. 
It is not purely an RNA1 polymerase inhibitor. It has a number of other uh, different mechanisms of action, including the fact that it's a G quadruplex stabilizer. We are able to make it in a uh, solution at low pH, and uh, using that low pH solution, they have conducted uh, clinical trials in Australia and Canada. Um, those trials uh, are ongoing. There is a dose limiting toxicity, which includes this hand and foot syndrome, and that really is a skin toxicity, and the other one is a phototoxicity, which is also a skin toxicity. They have seen partial um, effects in treated patient populations, but these patients tend to relapse, so we know that this compound would have to be developed as a combination product, which I won't talk about today. We discovered, I don't, sh I, I, I use a lousy mixture to show the, um, is it, have I gone on too long? Yeah, oh, uh, thanks for trying to keep it so short. Do you have a, just one more slide? I I just, do I have a few more minutes? Oh, yeah, one more minute. I'll, I'll go on for, okay, I'll go on a little bit longer. Um, so the, in, in this case, uh, this compound, we didn't identify the metal binding site, but we discovered that there was a metal binding site and we could load using the Metaplex technology. We have developed an intravenous formulation for it. It extends the circulation lifetime of the free drug as shown in the uh, upper right-hand figure. Um, and the product that we have is therapeutically more efficacious than the free drug. It's actually better tolerated than the free drug and this is in a pancreatic cancer model. What's interesting is that this compound can also be given orally. We believe that the Metaplex product is actually a microcrystal that's trapped inside the liposome, and that gives us the opportunity to consider these for oral products. When you're using the Metaplex product, the CX5461 has a higher AUC, also has a limited uh, improvement in therapeutic activity compared to the free drug. Uh, these studies are ongoing, and we think uh, with uh, better dosing, we can get better results. You know, what's surprising about this is we have looked at different formulations based off of lipid composition, disterol, phosphatidylcholine, and copper, uh, or dimersal cholesterol, uh, dimersal phosphatidylcholine and copper. And if you start looking at the drug to lipid ratio released after IV administration in the mouse, and that's on the lower uh, right hand figure, you can see that the release characteristics in these two liposomes are really quite comparable. Um, we are going to develop this technology as a drug combination product. Uh, Paul Cardi is in town and uh, at this meeting, he's talking, uh, well, I don't know what he's talk about, but he's the one who developed Vixios for a company we started called Celator. Uh, and we really are looking to how to develop this product as a first in class combination product. So the Metaplex uh, approach can increase the solubility, improve drug exposure, reduce CMAX related toxicity, improve therapeutic activity. We can use it to prepare uh, drug combination products. Uh, we know we can obtain proof of principle data and preclinical models. Uh, we can design systems for scaled manufacturing and support the chemistry manufacturing uh, control elements uh, for fructose formulations. So we have a lot of stuff going on. I won't talk about the people. This is actually available on uh, the web. 